thank organizers for, for inviting me here and everyone for coming. So, yeah, I'll counter diabetic is, of course, anti diabetic, and I'll try to explain this. So, this looks like a, a topic which seems a bit orthogonal uh, to the workshop, but I'll try to convince you that it's actually not. It's how we can. Uh, um, uh, we, we can try um, to fight dissipation in our system. So in some sense, and that's of course important for creating f fast engines, for uh, optimizing efficiencies and so on and so forth. I, I pretty much hope that actually Chris Yerzinski, who worked on this topic recently quite a lot, will give an introductory part, but he did not. So I will have to advertise a lot of Chris' work and, and, and in the beginning, and then hopefully I will go to complex systems in the end, uh, I don't know, it's very visible. Okay, is it better? So let me first mention that um, uh, the work was mostly done by a few people. It started with Luca D'Alessio, and then Marin Bukov, Michael Adrubitz contributed. Uh, the most of the work was really done by, by this gentleman, Dries Sells, who is now actually part-time, still postdoc at BU, part-time at Harvard. And uh, I didn't find a picture. There's another person from uh, Shor Sigura from Tokyo. So I'll, I'll try to give you some kind of idea of what counter-diabetic is about and how it's related to fast-forward protocols, and that's a big topic now. And then I will uh, talk a little bit about unpublished results, how this counter-diabetic driving, or if you want, uh, fighting dissipation brings, that, uh, brings us back to Kortevik de Vries equation and, and things like integrability in, in sort of unexpected ways. And I will be explicit what quantum mechanics adds to, to classical results. And then I will uh, uh, tell how we can approximately find this uh, uh, counter diabetic driving protocols and many other things in complex interacting systems. So hopefully <coughs> I will have time for that as well. So I'll try to show some formulas and then pictures, and then formulas and pictures. So if formulas are too heavy, just ignore them. I'm trying with each iteration to reduce number of formulas, increase number of pictures, but probably I didn't reach the, the right balance yet. Uh, anyway, so I, I want to, th this thing I, I, I think personally should be part of any like course in quantum and classical mechanics, but it's not. Uh, so everyone has to learn it in its own way. So let me just go through what really adiabatic transformations in quantum systems are and, and uh, then I'll hopefully explain the, the concept. So let's assume that we have some wave function, could be density matrix. And then, well, uh, classically we know if you go to a moving frame or do transformation, we actually change canonical variables. We change definition of what we mean by X and P. Quantum mechanically, what we do, we rotate our wave function or rotate the basis. So let's assume that we do some uh, continuous rotation. So I will assume everything is differentiable with respect to some parameter lambda. Lambda could be position, could be something else, magnetic field, whatever you, you like. And then uh, if it's differentiable, I can differentiate with respect to lambda. And then uh, after like staring a little bit, we will see that we get basically a Schrodinger equation where this A, this very important object, which I'll refer to as gauge potential, or in mathematics it's known as connection, it's basically a generator of this adiabatic transformation, some Fermission operator. And classically, it's a generator of canonical transformations. So it's, it's everything so far refers to quantum and classical in the same way. And now if we try to write what's the equation of motion in a moving frame, so we just plug this into Schrodinger equation, well, we'll get two terms. So one is like this usual Hamiltonian, which we address by this unitaries because we rotate basis. But then there is another term which comes from differentiating this guy, and I can use a chain rule and realize this is basically like a Galilean term, V times this A, and A is, is for translations is just momentum, for rotations it's angular momentum. So you might recognize that this is an equation we all very well know. But it's true always. So, and I will be very interested in a special frame where this U diagonalizes the, the instantaneous Hamiltonian. So let me spend one more slide just to, to make it more interesting. It turns out that this object, A, is very interesting. So its expectation value is very connection. So it's, it's all geometry in quantum mechanics comes from. Uh, so if, right, 
uh, I'll skip the relation. So if you take commutator of these two gauge potentials and take expectation value, we'll actually get very, very curvature, also very well known object. And what is perhaps a bit less known, but if you take uh, covariance or symmetric expectation value of these gauge potentials, we will get metric tensor. It's also known as fidelity susceptibility. It's related to Fisher information and, and now is used in quantum information theory and so on. So this object, what I'm trying to say, which define dynamics, they also define many, many other properties of the systems. And that's why we, we have like uh, many interesting effects. Okay, but now let me go and say what counter diabetic uh, is. And, and the original idea uh, was coming uh, from uh, two chemists uh, Demir, Plack, and Rice in, in 2003, and then independently by Beria under slightly different name, transitionless driving. And then after that, there were many papers, and, and Chris was really uh, like uh, a motor in, in, in many of them. Also Adolfo, who, who probably is teaching now, uh, he's in this workshop. So uh, the idea is kind of very simple. So if you go to a moving frame, we get this Hamiltonian. And all transitions are due to this guy, because remember, this is just diagonal matrix. We diagonalized it. So let's try to remove this. And the idea is that let's add this term back. And sorry, I switched from alpha to lambda. It's like really the same thing. And then uh, if we do this, then our moving Hamiltonian is nothing but a bunch of energies times eigenstate. So it, it, if you want, moving Hamiltonian is always static. So, and then it means that if we can implement this Hamiltonian, we just suppress all transitions whatsoever. So the system doesn't dissipate energy. So all energy changes, uh, in a sense, we get like perfect work, we get all 100% efficiencies, like anything, we, we don't absorb it. So it can sound like a crazy thing, but let me say that actually this is a simple picture where a waiter really implements counter diabetic driving. So it's something we see uh, around all the time, and that's what we do all the time. We just we probably don't realize how it happens. So let's assume that the waiter wants to bring a glass of water, say, across the room. And of course, the goal is not to excite it, so to keep it always in equilibrium, right? So well, what we can do, we can just keep it always vertical, right, and go slowly. That's what our adiabatic process is, and we generate very little heat or whatever. But this waiter will not be paid very well if he does this, because it's extremely slow. So a waiter probably will start running. But if it runs just straight, then obviously he will excite the food, and, and he will also probably be fired. But if, if the waiter implements like a, f a fancy move, so he sort of will counter uh, uh, this emergent inertia and all other forces, then it will work actually pretty well. Maybe waiter will still excite water, but much less. And as I will show in a second, this is really counter diabetic driving. So why does it cancel dissipation? Can I explain it on, on much simpler problem? Let's go back to that. Well, because he implements this extra gravity which cancels force of inertia. And that's what I'm going to explain if, if you wait. So he cancels inertia with extra, by tilting, he introduces extra gravi gravitational force. So inertia wants to push water back, but this tilt pushes it actually so in it's opposite direction. Dissipation as it is reaction. Well, I, I don't know how you call it. I mean, if you splash the water, you obviously dissipate a lot of energy to atmosphere. So I, I don't want to, to, to use terminology. It's non-adiabatic stuff, let me put it this way. But that's what we usually mean by dissipation. Okay, so let me uh, consider this extremely simple example. It's a cartoon of a waiter. So we have a particle in a box. And we want to move a box without exciting the particle. So my potential depends on x minus x naught, and x naught is just center of mass position of the box. So, well, of course, we can do the same. We can move box slowly. If we move it fast, we will excite this particle like to high energy states. And that's what I will call here dissipation without, in a sense, it's non-adiabatic. Transition. So, well, if, if you go to a moving Hamiltonian, well, here we'll get really standard Galilean transformation because our what is gauge potential is nothing but the momentum uh, uh, operator. So we'll get x minus v dot p. This is sorry, just very famous. How is what is little m here? 
Oh, it's little, um, uh, it's a mass of, of the particle inside, and we have a big mass, it's its mass of the box. And how is it that everything with the box is just randomly is... Well, say we have the particle, for example, in some stationary state, could be ground state, could be excited ah, okay. state, could be thermal equilibrium, but the point that if we Gibbs ensemble, it's okay, right? But if you move it fast, we'll obviously excite it, right? Okay, so uh, now what we need to do, we need to add this term back. And so if we can implement Hamiltonian, which is this H, whatever it is, yeah, this original H plus V dot P, we are done. So Hamiltonian is time independent, and, uh, and that's it. But that's actually very hard to implement. Well, one can do it if particle has electromagnetic charge. You might recognize that this is what couples to momentum is electromagnetic potential, but it's not easy. And that's not what the weight does. Liquid is, is, is uh, 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 neutral. So what Waiter does in his head probably, he does another transformation, um, change of variables or gauge transformation as we know it in electromagnetism. And this uh, comes from knowing that if we complete the square, we will see that, well, it's a standard thing. We can trade for shift in momentum with extra term here. Uh, this can be understood exactly in the same way. So now we're shifting not coordinate by momentum. Therefore, generator of the shift is minus x. And if you do through all this algebra, we'll go to very well-known electromagnetic expression, right? Uh, this shift in, in uh, uh, momentum is equivalent to shift in potential, which is, has extra time derivative. And now if you stare at it, we'll say, yeah, obviously. So it's exactly what Waiter is doing. We are accelerating the box and introducing counter gravitational field, which makes this cancels all the forces. So right in the moving frame, particle doesn't feel anything. And that's true as we obviously understand for any state, ground state, excited state, and so on. Uh, there is a caveat, and that's actually what's known is as fast forward protocol. There is different nomenclature, and things are only merging now. So people implementing them a lot in, in this quantum computing business, superconducting qubits, and so on. So in, in, in fast forward protocol, we actually don't follow the ground state, right? Because clearly weight tilts uh, the glass and moves. So it's not the ground state of the water. But we follow ground state of so-called gauge equivalent Hamiltonian. But the point that as long as the beginning and in the end, uh, our shift, momentum shift is zero, we are fine. We just find another pass, right? And, and that's exactly what Waiter does. So it start, he starts adiabatically in the beginning, and in the end, when he slows down, water is again vertical, so he has to come back. It actually turns out to be a very hard problem. We try to work quite a bit um, on this. So what happens if you try to do this non-abelian rotations, which don't commute with itself, and which classes of protocols can be mapped? And I just want to highlight it's problem for us, for theorists, not for, for experimentalists. Experimentally, just implement this protocol, you don't think in these terms, like what is gauge equivalent to what, you don't care. Okay, so there is a little bit more complicated example and a bit less intuitive, and I refer to this paper where uh, uh, Sebastian Defner, Chris, and Adolfo, is that what if you move only one wall <coughs> in the box? So, and, and, and then it turns out it's exactly the same uh, story, but now instead of translations, I have to use dilation or dilatation operator and if I go through the same arguments, I will get that I need to introduce quadratic potential. So, and one can ask, okay, so these are simple examples, but can I do it in a more general sense? And then we are clear, we have to find what's, the, what's this gauge potential. Well, one thing I mentioned already, analogy with momentum operator, and it's indeed like a momentum operator. If you consider two eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, it acts on them as derivative. So it's re really like a momentum operator in this sense. And then, uh, well, it's, it's like standard perturbation theory. We have exact result. So it's exact, but impractical unless we have some symmetry. So if all states rotate in the same way or translate in the same way, we cannot make use of this expression. So, so and... Also, for uh, chaotic systems, it Ill, it's ill defined. So it turns out that Chris Yardinsky back in 95 uh, had a, a very nice proof of this. And uh, uh, from, for quantum systems, from eigenstate normalization hypothesis, you can prove it also in one line. So this, this object, it's nice, but essentially it's just a mathematical object like a projection operator. It doesn't exist in general. So that's, of course, the bad news. Well, we can make it a little bit nicer, this equation. 
uh, by multiplying both sides by denominator, and then what we find the first connection to thermodynamics professed in, in this talk, that uh, we need to find this equation, so it's like uh, solve this equation, so derivative of Hamiltonian plus, uh, it's all dying, plus the commutator of this gauge potential as H should give me, uh, should be a derivative of my diagonal Hamiltonian, which is a vector of generalized forces. These are our standard thermodynamics forces. So this looks a little bit nicer, but still requires knowledge of what these guys are. And in complex systems, it's hard to find them. And then we, we just make one more observation. Then actually we can exclude all, all these guys together by, com uh, all together by observing that this term commutes with the Hamiltonian. And that's the final equation we need to solve. It contains now no reference to either states or spectrum or anything. So we just need to find A which satisfies this. So there is some double commutator structure. And uh, just want to highlight, so there is so far nothing quantum here except for language. And I, I wish that we are more clear when we talk about quantum effects and when we talk about using quantum language. It's a standard problem now. So, and, uh, oh, sorry. And it turns out that there is another interesting uh, connection. Uh, so there is a very known Wagner-Wilson flow equations, which people use a lot in high energy physics and other areas of physics. And if spectrum is, it doesn't change, they're exactly those. So there, there is a, a lot behind these equations. And I want to say that if we can solve this equation exactly or approximately, well, we can do a lot. We can find dissipation, as I tried to, 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 to mention. We know topology of the states, all this quantum nice stuff, quantum Hall effect, and so on, uh, uh, topological insulators. Everything is, is, is hidden here. Uh, there is geometry. We know thermodynamic forces. We can, uh, I'm not going to talk about this, but we can define time bounds, how fast you can do any processes, and uh, define linear and nonlinear response, and so on. So essentially, a lot of physics is contained in this object. So the question, how we find it. Okay, and there are two ways I want to highlight. So it's pretty much in the air. One, let's try to find Hamiltonians for which we can find exact solutions. So it's sort of like Hamiltonians for which systems, we ask the question, for which systems we can exactly cancel dissipation. I, I showed already a couple of examples, but maybe let's do more. And let me start from being classical. So I want to solve this equation. And, uh, well, as we know in thermodynamics, I... probably answered it, but I didn't hear it. What does the Curry bracket mean? Oh, it's Poisson bracket, sorry. It's Poisson bracket. It's classical. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I have to say, uh, say it explicitly. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a Poisson bracket. So, and actually that's something we, of course, uh, solve s equations like that in the context of statistical mechanics. We ask, well, if Poisson bracket of something is Hamiltonian vanishes, it means it's conserved quantity. And as we say in standard courses, we are saying, let's say that this object is a function of Hamiltonian. That's the simplest thing how we find it. And that's how we can justify various ensembles and so on. So, and in particular, we can choose it to be a linear function of the Hamiltonian, or we can also choose it as nonlinear function of Hamiltonian. So and now this equation becomes very simple. Uh, there will be very few equations ahead, so uh, I'm almost done with them. But I, I just want to show how it works, that there is no like mystery, no complicated like analysis and so on. I just write basically derivative of my Hamiltonian respect to some parameter lambda, say potential, uh, and so far it's an arbitrary parameter I can translate, dilate, maybe do something else. And then I write Poisson bracket. It's dA dQ times dH dP, which is P over M, and, and then the opposite term. And then if you stare here for 60 seconds, which I'm not giving you really, but really 60 seconds is enough, you realize that there is a very simple ansatz which solves it. Because I, I essentially, if I want to solve it, I want to have only terms which are quadratic in, in momentum and contain no momentum at all. And if A is linear in P, you just see this will be quadratic in momentum and this will be independent of momentum. So it's like a very, very si nice ansatz. So I plug it in and I find that, well, translations and dilations is the all we can do within this ansatz. So what the scale invariant uh, driving, which was introduced by, by Chris Herzinski and others, is basically all possible simple solutions within this class. So it's a little discouraging. But then we have to stare a bit more. And then if you stare a little bit more, we can realize that if A is cubic in P, then it will also work. Because this term doesn't care, it's dA dQ. 
but this term will be quadratic in P as well. So we can also close on that. And going ahead, you can start adding more powers, fifths, sevenths, and so on. And I don't think anyone did this, really. But cubic is already interesting. So now you have not to just stare, but write two lines of calculations. And then you will find something interesting, that we should satisfy dispersionless, no, not dissipationless, sorry, dispersion, oh, wait, dispersionless, that's correct, KDV equation. So suddenly we find uh, out of blue something like extremely interesting. I have to say this result was independently also obtained by, by uh, Takahashi and Kuyama. So out of the blue, we get something interesting. In order to realize this dissipational driving, we need our potential V to satisfy a certain integrable equation. Maybe it's expected, like it should be integral, but I have to say that it's not really trivial because in some sense, we are defining time-dependent integrability because we, are, we want to do time-dependent process and not excite the system. It's not how things are usually done in integrability. <coughs> But things become really surprising, at least to me, if we now add quantum mechanics. So now I, I just explained. So I think classically we are done with the result, but now let me really add quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics means I have to consider commutate and not the Poisson bracket. And then I can do the same ansatz, and then you can just, well, you can imagine that if A is proportional to P cube, there will be some extra third derivative term. It's much, if you know the language of Moyle brackets, it's much easier uh, quantum bracket if you want this sign of Poisson bracket. So you'll get third derivative term from this, but you, you can derive it in a variety of ways. And then we get something, at least in my opinion, amazing. I, uh, and and <coughs> I, I talked to, to Sasha Abanov recently about this and, and he's really expert in integrability. So he found it also surprising and we talked a lot we don't fully understand what this result really means. But we find that dispersion is now a quantum effect. So what we want to do, we want to drive the system without dissipation, quantum system, and we ask which potential we can realize that, that we can drive the system without dissipation. And this is the potential which, which satisfies classical KGV equation, but the dispersion is fully set by Planck, uh, Planck's constant. So we can go in increased complexity of the ansatz and so on. So I just, this morning, I, I stole some pictures from this site. So that's what it really means. So we can, for example, well, you know, KDV equation has solitons, right? So we can, for example, create a potential like this of blue shape or red shape, move it in arbitrary way, fast or slowly, and then if we implement correct Hamiltonian, which I show in a second, the point that whatever particles I have outside, I'm not going to scatter them. So I'm, I, I just go through without exciting the particles. But if I have a state with given, say, free energy, I will end up with state with exactly same free energy, or in, in case of translations, even in the same energy, right? But I can also, in, instead of moving, I can load it into solitons. So I, 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 lambda is arbitrary parameter. It couldn't, doesn't have to be a position. So, but for this, we need to realize this funny Hamiltonian, and, and here sort of my intuition stops. Um, so one has to think really hard. Th this is very new result, still unpublished. So we need to realize, so we can move with arbitrary speed, as I said, but we need to subtract velocity times this gauge potential, which is essentially P times the same Hamiltonian with some factors like one half floating around. So P cube is unusual. It's not what we usually do, but if we have, for example, say optical lattices or periodic potentials, we can definitely design Hamiltonians like that. If you break translational symmetry, you have superpositions of sines and cosines, which can give us cubic dispersion. Maybe one can treat it perturbatively and so on. I just want to stop here. Good. So, and then I personally believe one can go on and one can now consider more comp not single particle systems, but many particle systems and ask like, which kind of ansatz uh, can close equations. And then we get, in my opinion, this very unintuitive. So it's results which are hard to predict just without doing calculations. So now let me move to many particle systems. I, I still consider non-interacting. So this is say particles, fermions, or bosons moving in the lattice. We still need to solve the same equation. Now I, I forgot about h bar. Can I, can I suggest to the pause because I'm at the verge of deciding this is a really interesting talk or it's bullshit. 
<laughs> so let me tell you why I think it might be the last potential smart guy I know it's interesting. Look, you're talking about dissipation. Dissipation means density matrices or ones of our operators, but not always. It can mean bigner Weisskopf theory where I keep all the states. So help me out. How is it that you're getting dissipation language without the usual machinery? I'll show an example. There is a lot of... I, I can always take what, what, for example, Jens was talking about. I can take some dynamic limit of a system. I'll show it. And then if everything else is in the mass, or, sorry, is, is, is in thermal equilibrium, then uh, you so, know... So do you mean like Ginsburg landau I write it in No, I, I did, so you, you can mean? consider any system as closed system, but you do just some local perturbation. So I have some large Hamiltonian, say, describes universe, and I'm actually coming to locality slowly. So in, in this case uh, of, of particle, if you don't like language of dissipation, let's say it's not dissipation, but basically I'm saying, it, 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 I'm saying it the following. So you take a box with the particle, you shake in a special way, you shake it long, long time, you open the box, and the particle is in exactly the same state. That's very non-trivial. Yeah. So, uh, normally, you can introduce this dephasing, you can introduce like, uncertainty in time, and so on. So, normally, uh, you will, of course, excite the party. And I even don't want to go into details what we call dissipation, what is not. By dissipation, uh, if you want, in, in, in language of information, I preserve fidelity of my state. Or you can say that if I do, say, cyclic process, my energy comes back to, to the original energy. So, in this sense, sorry. Yeah, good. I, I think you're answering my question. Anybody else have this? Yeah. So, uh, actually, I uh, like, like uh, Marlon, I would uh, question the, uh, the compatibility of this description with, uh, with the open system. Uh, uh, oh, that's an interesting okay. I, I'll show. Uh, this is, uh, I think, completely incompatible. Because basically, uh, if, if it were, it wouldn't I'll just show you a waiter, so completely doesn't work. Waiter operates in an open system. Waiter breathes. Waiter. Well, it depends so, on what you call. You may call it's it. It's not completely, system. but it's not because uh, that would mean actually <laughs> that you convert an irreversible process into a reversible process just by applying a conservative force, and that cannot be. <coughs> so that he's, cannot be. He's really hitting the nail on the head. Think Victor Weisskopf, right? I've got decay. I see the atom is decaying. Must be irreversible. No. It's reversible if you keep all the states of the field uh, in the air. May I suggest you, I'll come back to this, I promise, if I go to the end of the talk, I'll come back. I have simple examples, but they're kind of non-trivial. I can even mention some kind of black hole physics, which you should Black hole, so that, that's what I've been Does it make it catch yes. Uh, I mean, there is a lot of interesting physics because coming in. Well, that will never side, come back, right? We're on your side. We think I'm not saying that you suppress, you, I'm not saying you're cheating on some things. I'm just saying you can do faster processes without what you normally do with slower speeds. You can just speed up your process. You cannot beat Carnot efficiency. I'm not saying it. But I'm just saying that you can operate at much faster speeds. In some case, I'm not saying all case. So far, I just went through some cases where you can. There are cases where you cannot. It depends on your new system. So. Good. Uh, okay. So there's another example which we can solve, and that's I promise the last example which in this talk which we can solve with that. So we mentioned that they have particles uh, in in some potential. We need to solve sort of this equation. And then, if you gain stare for another m minute, you, you understand that uh, your gauge potential is not interacting, so and it also has to be imaginary to cancel this out. So it should be in, in form of some currents, which you want to... And it's similar to momentum, of course. So, but the problem is that, in general, you have to introduce long-range hoppings, which are extremely hard to realize. But it turns out that if you want to change electric field only, then it's another nice example where you can set, uh, find the exact solution so where you just introduce nearest neighbor current. Again, like with the vector, I'll go, uh, sorry, with, with the waiter, I'll go a little bit faster through this. There is what's known as spiral transformation. You can just shift everything, all phases. And if you do it, you can come up with nice fast forward Hamiltonian, where it turns out that what you have to do is to introduce a special electric field, not naive electric field, but special electric field. Instead of going through formulas, I show you a picture. 
So suppose you want to change electric field for some finite a small value. I don't want zero because, of course, in thermodynamic limit you will get issues. And then uh, 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 let me start from a small value and then I lower it to a large value. And then if you do it in a naive way, you will get pretty bad fidelity. You'll excite a lot of stuff. But if instead you follow a blue line, which is quite robust, actually, I have to say, it's, it's not, there's no fine tuning or anything. So you first kind of kick particles forward, then you switch electric field and you catch them. And if you think about what you do with water, it's actually very sensible. You first kick it strongly forward and then you catch it. And then it's, of course, you much faster move the water than if you move the bucket. So it's really hydrodynamics. There is no, even though it's not interacting, there is nothing like once you understand what these formulas mean, they, they make perfect physical sense. Okay, but now what if we cannot solve the problem? Like problem with weight that we cannot possibly solve. And then uh, there is a little bit of mass. Uh, uh, you can uh, trust me, I hope, uh, that actually this equation which, I, which we always had to solve is nothing but minimization principle of trace of this operator squared. So. Uh, minimum, we minimize respect to x, and if we find the minimum, we are done, we found a. Why minimization is good? Well, because we can now use variational principle. So we don't have to find exact minimum, we, we need to find approximate minimum. And uh, the nice thing is that if we want to do it, we just choose ansatz for chi, we minimize its quadratic minimization problem, and we don't need to diagnose Hamiltonian. We don't need to do like anything. We don't need to know energy spectrum. We immediately get the answer. So, and actually this problem, just another connection with what people are doing, there are actually a lot of activity in this, finding the slowest operators and they related to diffusion, subdiffusion and so on. It turns out that mathematically it's basically the same problem. Okay, so let me uh, maybe show how it works. Now I just flash the results. Of course, th there is no way I can, I can go through calculations. So now let's assume that we want to insert some generic potential. The problem is still not interacting, but I break translational symmetry. It becomes pretty hard. So then I, I will choose just, I, as I said, the exact solution will involve all long-range hoppings. And let me stop only nearest neighbor hoppings, because that's something I can uh, gauge away and, and map to, to just time-dependent hopping and time-dependent potential, something I can implement in experiments. So I, I, I don't want to, you to go through this uh, formula. I just, I just want to, to say that in reality it's really simple thing. It just takes you, you know, 15 minutes and then you are done. So you take this ansatz for chi, then you compute g, which is derivative of Hamiltonian, and the commutator of Hamiltonian and this chi. Well, you can sort of figure out what this commutator is. And then you have to compute trace norm of this guy squared, which is basically sum of coefficients squared, and that's it, and minimize. So it's very simple. And this minimization, you get sort of Laplace type equation. So this alpha acquires some profile. Uh, there are interesting profiles, but I'll show the pictures and it will explain what this profile really means. And then if we perform the spiral transformation, it's exactly the same thing. We have to implement, now it's approximately, some space dependent hopping and space-dependent potential to suppress dissipation. And let me actually say that, uh, well, I'll show in the pictures what goes on, but uh, you're saying words. So if, uh, if we do small velocity, we renormalize the potential only. If we do large velocity, we actually normalize hopping. And this is what I mean. This is actually doing local refracting index. Because if we renormalize hopping, it's like we renormalize the Hamiltonian, but it's the same as we renormalizing time. So if you want, we introduce time metric. We just make, make particles slower. And that's the trick how we can, uh, suppress dissipation. We turn on impurity. Particles want to escape, but we slow down them nearby. So they actually, like a glue, they, they stay close to the potential. So we excite the system, but uh, really much less. So th this, uh, two more examples, and I, I think, well, a few more examples, and it will be done. So let's consider, like, turn on some one over Cauch potential choices arbitrary to, to otherwise non-interacting uh, C of electrons. It turns out it's an Anderson orthogonality catastrophe. So it's a very famous problem. You take Fermi gas, you introduce one impurity, you create orthogonal state. So for this reason, it's actually extremely hard to be adiabatic. And then uh, if we do just standard protocol, this is like this orange line, for 512 sites and 256 particles, in time of the order of 10, 
So everything of the order of one, time is even towards the diabetic side. Uh, so it's like reasonably slow time. You will get fidelity 10 to the minus 30, and you understand why. You just excite a lot of stuff. Then you implement this counter diabetic potential, which uh, 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 just described uh, in words. And then you find that uh, you will get fidelity 0.5, almost 0.6. It isn't even not fidelity, fidelity squared. So it means that with probability 50%, you'll measure exact ground state. And uh, this is remarkable. That's a good example, I have to say, that not examples, uh, not all examples are like that, but, but, but still it's, it's um, interesting. So that's another example. Suppose we want to move an obstacle in Fermi C. So this is what's shown is, is Fermi density, so density of fermions as a function of time, and we move slowly here it's adiabatic. We move very, very slowly in purity from minus 100 to 100, so we just move it. And then if we do it adiabatically, we just, fermions just follow this dip. Well, that's standard, right? On the other hand, blue means we have depletion of fermions. On the other hand, if we move it uh, with finite speed, well, in front of impurity or potential, we will create excess density, well, pushing particles. Behind, you have depleted density. Well, now I would really argue this is dissipation because we are, particles are not even able to reach uh, boundaries of the system. So it's really like you, you are in, in uh, uh, coupled to infinite bass. So now we implement this counter diabetic term, and it's kind of very interesting. So Actually, if I move slowly, then what it does is trivial things. So the reason you dissipate is particles hit you. If you move towards particles, they more often hit you uh, um, um, on your chest than on your back. So that's why you dissipate it. So actually, what this counter-diabatic potential tells you that slow particles in front of you. It's kind of trivial. But if you move very fast, you cannot do it anymore. In the latest, you have maximum velocity. And then you do this game with a refraction index. So you create sort of black hole. It doesn't. So for the time scales, like the adiabatic, how like, naive and counter like you said you're moving it? Or like what yeah. I'm seeing here? Oh, yeah, I forgot the time scale. It was also of the order of, like, everything was of the order of one. So it was, uh, I forgot what exactly velocity was, but it's, it's like uh, basically a, say, a uh, fraction of sites, like one half of the site per uh, hopping. So it was not extremely fast, but it was also not. And, and the ground state, like, okay. Yeah, yeah, this is the ground state. This is what you will generate if you move uh, without counter-diabatic. And, and the counter-diabatic and the naive, they are the same velocity? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are exactly the same velocity, just in another case, you just add this extra term. Yeah, yeah, and the same in the previous picture. Otherwise, I would be cheating. No, it's same time scale, same velocity. Uh, so open systems, we, we don't have much to say at this moment. We are working on this, and uh, Chris had a paper, but I, I think there are still, at least in my opinion, there are lots of things which are unsettled. So uh, one can uh, do the same trick, so I can just address one spin, and then I treat everything else as a bass. So everything is Hamiltonian, but it's a setup of an open system. And then you just try to, say, shake or rotate some local magnetic field, and then you can show that counter-diabatic term will be, in, in the leading order, just local field applied to this spin. But then uh, if you can modify nearest neighbor interactions, then you can add another term and so on. And then you solve it variationally, and, and uh, this is what you get. You can characterize how good you are by actually dissipation. Um, uh, so how much energy you dissipate if you start shaking the system. Uh, but dissipation in terms of energy is not very good because if you reach infinite temperature state, you stop dissipating energy. So instead of using dissipation, we use kind of dissipation of energy variance, how fast energy variance grows. This is a good measure at zero temperature at high temperature. And essentially what is shown, so this horizontal axis is number of the states that are all eigenstates in the system of, I forgot, 15 spins, which I encoded here. And this is some dissipation within Fermi-Golden rule. It's a measure of non-adiabaticity. What will happen if you don't apply anything? And then uh, this, if you have single counter term, this is like if you have two spin counter term. And you see you both decrease dissipation. You actually make system much more uniform. You suppress fluctuations. So which kind of tells you that actually you can reach adiabatic limit in the sense of thermodynamics, uh, in the sense of energy shells, but you can never reach it in the sense of eigenstates. So things will diverge.
I, I think I'm probably done with time, so I, there are some another surprises, but I will need more time to explain, so I guess I, I'll just stop. Uh, well, let me just say one more thing, uh, is that uh, I focused on the dissipation here, but well, one thing we are kind of interested in is understanding how integrability is destroyed, how we go from non-ergodic to ergodic. And it turns out that, again, this gauge potential is extremely uh, uh, helpful. Because it turns out that you can, if you ask how I can propagate from state, say, with field H to state with magnetic field H plus delta H, it turns out that the fastest, actually, protocol is this counter-diabatic. So if, if you do nothing, you can just do slow adiabatic evolution, but it will take a long time. This counter-diabatic is really fastest in some sense. And then uh, if you know this gauge potential, you can use it to, for example, dress integrals of motion, and if gauge potential is local, it means that these integrals of motion are preserved, so you have conserved quantities. And we have surprising results in, in translation invariant model, and we address, again, all states, not just the ground state, that uh, in some regimes we see that integrability should be preserved much more than we expected. It might be at the end breakdown in some dynamic limit, but at least it's preserved to a very, very high degree. And this is also unpublished. All right, so in summary, uh, okay. I, I, you can read this. I actually honestly don't know. I don't know, but it's, it's possible. Cubic, yeah. Cubic in moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because normally they evolve, they evolve with that, right? And if, if well, you cancel, yeah. If you cancel the one only thing which I, I would say is surprising to me at least, yeah, it's probably true. So the, the thing, uh, one of the things surprising, uh, most surprising to me was that dispersion went, at, went as, as a quantum effect, as proportional to h-bar squared. Yeah, yeah. uh, this I really don't know, uh, but I, 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 I think you should be right. It's yeah, most I, likely I, it's yeah, true. I know, I know what it is. That's, that's the but thing then which the probably that's actually, what, and you can continue this hierarchy. Yeah. You can go to people yeah. who feel this so called hierarchy. So this might be actually a root of defining time-dependent yes. integrability, which I mentioned, because you can actually say what exactly you need to realize this. We should, we should probably talk about it at length, because I, there's a similar connection, not, not to the Lux operator, but to, to the Bogolub-Degens right. operator. Right. And if you replace the court event with freeze by, uh, by a derivative of the solution of the Simon Gordon, right. I think you can repeat your trick, but without the thing you don't like. So, so we should. I mean, okay. we're able. Oh, so, so of course, I hope to go with these too many particle <coughs> systems. Like, what? I, this single particle example. I was just curious. Can we go beyond dilations, translations? And you should sort of blame this. We, we, we found it, but then it was already published. And then, well, you should do something else. And then I mean, for, kind for, of for, for Simon, but, for Simon Gordon, uh, but in principle, you can even break translational symmetry. You can you can start playing these games with spin chains and so on. You just yeah. try to do as many particles. Of course, it's unclear what you will get. Uh, but it, well, given that there is already non-trivial uh, result that dispersion entered through H bar, and this makes difference between quantum and classical, it's a big difference. You will get solitons. I mean, the dispersion is a really quantum effect, so the potential which you realize really depends on which bar. So, it's good surprise. so probably for us, the pro 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 um, problem is they will be surprised. Yeah. But I, I talked to Asasha about there are many analogies with integrability, it's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So can you reduce entropy by this trick? Uh, actually, not by this trick, but uh, I mean, you, of, of course not, because if you have unitary evolution, then you can go you, down. You but could. What, what you can, Surprisingly, if you start from a single eigenstate of a complex system, well, it's not surprising for some people, but at least uh, intuitively it's surprising, uh, and then it satisfies eigenstate summarization hypothesis, so local entropy, this entanglement entropy, is thermal as high as you can, but you can still actually cool down the state with just local processes, if, if you allow exponential time. But those things will be extremely unstable. So those, you just do tiny mistake and so on. 
Uh, I think it's surprising because locally you only see this high entropy state, and yet you can sort of by doing local manipulations you can. Sorry, there. Sorry. Um, I found this problem of Anderson art was not the catastrophe. This example very very nice. So I mean, if I if I can think in the frequency domain, like the Mahan, the Dominici's kind of uh, you know Fermi-H singularity in absorption mm -hmm. spectrum, yeah. can I think about this application of this concrete abatic term as something that basically would suppress such singularities? Well, it will. I, I think it's the same. You're absolutely right. So it, it's almost the same problem. Just you shift frequency. So. Well, it just suppresses dissipation. So if you want, in, in sort of the fast limit, yeah. what, what you do, you just, if you can do it, of course, if you can access, so here you have to access nearby particles, near impurities, so hoping, so, so in the thermodynamic language, you slow the work distribution somehow that you would be looking at there? Well, yeah. work distribution at the end will be almost like a delta function in the sense that you just uh, go to, to desired state. But of course, there will be also tails. But distribution will be much less... Uh, broad than if you, if you do it without the kind of right? I, I think there are interesting. The reason I went through this example slowly, I just hope that someone in the experimental community will get interested. But they're in doing this experiment in Rudy Grimm's group in Innsbruck, right? Counter diabetic? No, impurities in the Oh, yeah, yeah. But then the one has to implement, one has to access local. In cold atoms, it looks like it's possible. If you addressing some variational way, I highlighted variational approach, so you don't need to do exactly, you just find a good profile of hoppings, which obviously you have to slow down the impurity, so on. and if you can do it, so just raise intensity, for example, laser in some way, right, independent way, then actually uh, it should work, so at least you should improve. Should be no problem in the continuum. Other questions? Well, some examples I showed were in continuum, but Coming back to your spin one half example, can you introduce some kind of uh, Yang knows non abelian gauge uh, characterization? Yeah, I mean, uh, you can, it's just the question what you gain, because in some sense, uh, you already, you always non abelian, and this actually was the recently measured even in Jan Spielman experiment. This was done not through counter diabetic driving, but through adiabatic response. It turns out that same objects appear, so, and they measured, so you just need to have the genuine manifold. Now, in terms of counter diabetic driving, it's kind of, I think it's interesting if uh, experimentalists get there. It means that in order, now, your, the term which you have to implement depends on the state. Because now, a diabetic pass, so your state depends on, on the pass you choose. Because you have degeneracy, right, and that's, and therefore what you want to implement, uh, implement depends on the pass. So you, you go to the same point, but then you have to apply a different term to suppress so probably this can be used for many cool experimental effects, but uh, again, one has to get there. Good. So um, let's thank Anatoly for a very nice talk.